Hi, my name is Dr. Annette Bosworth and today I'm gonna talk about sleep. I tease my husband that this is my first love, sleep. Not only am I a stickler about my kids getting good sleep, our family having a good sleep bedtime, there was actually a chapter in medicine where I flirted with being a sleep doctor, studying people's sleep and really focusing on that solely as a practice. I'm an internal medicine doctor and I will tell you it's probably the best place to study and practice helping people with sleep because it links to so many problems. There are numerous studies about Americans and people across the globe not getting enough sleep. That seems like no big deal where time is money and the harder you work, the more value you have to the team. But what's interesting is some of the long-term effects that we see from people who have poor sleep or don't get enough. We know that sleep plays a pivotal role in putting down memories and being able to find them. And just recently, the last couple of years have shown us that during your sleep, your brain acts much like a dishwasher and flushes out debris and you can think of it as the dirt or grime that builds up in our brains during the day. During deep sleep, the area where the cerebral spinal fluid is in the brain dilates just a little bit and that fluid washes out this debris, if you would. Upon awakening, those canals and those channels go back to their normal size and with it flushes away some of this extra proteins and buildup in the human brain. Without a steady commitment to that eight hours of sleep, even just six or seven hours of sleep, we can see a, a buildup, much like a junkyard in the, at a cellular level for brain cells of people who sleep just that six or seven hours as opposed to eight hours every night. We know without good sleep, not only do the memories not link as well, but they show slower thinking, more depression, and an increased risk of dementia. Do you wonder if you get enough sleep? Well, one of the quickest ways to look and see if you're getting adequate sleep is actually to look at the scale. It turns out if you've got a fat tummy or if you're overweight, the chances you have high quality sleep go down. This seems too extreme to be true, but it's actually both a cause and an effect of poor sleep is being overweight. Let's just take a look at one of the recent studies studying obese people and what happens with their brains. They were men or pre-menopausal women who were all obese. They selected people who said they only got six and a half hours of sleep. They all got monitors to look at their sleep and at the beginning part of the study, they looked at their brains for attention, for cognitive function, how well they could compute, even just basic thinking. All of these were measured in all of the participants of the study. It wasn't surprising when we learned that of all of the folks studied saying they only got six and a half hours of sleep, a third of them had memory problems, a third of them had attention problems, about 40% had troubles with their motor skills, and then that prefrontal cortex executive thinking was not right in over half of them. Then the intervention came. So they told half of the people about sleep hygiene and really worked with them to get them to change behavior for just two weeks. They got televisions out of the bedroom, they set a reasonable bedtime, they stopped electronics two hours before bed, all of the sleep rules that lead to better sleep. And the other half, they just left alone. After two weeks, they went back and retested the people. And the ones who had been working on their sleep habit, habit all showed improvement in their memory, improvement in their attention, and they were able to have better global brain function overall. Now, this may not mean anything to most people, blah, 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 another study talking about brains and sleep. But I'll tell you what it helps me with is it continues to show us that there is a link between obesity and brains not sleeping well. We don't need to spend $5,000 on a sleep study to say, if you've got a fat tummy, your brain isn't working as well, you're not sleeping as well. And to keep working on that. The second thing that was really hopeful is two weeks. And these patients weren't great at these sleep rules. They just started to improve them but you could see a measurable difference of improvement with just two weeks of trying to work on those sleep habits. Sadly, most of Americans that are overweight have poor sleep habits. And poor sleep habits don't just link to fat tummies. Uh, poor sleep links to an increased risk of cancer, an increased risk of diabetes, having gut problems, depression, and overall mortality. Yeah, that's right. If you don't sleep well, you're one step closer to the grave. Sleep is a very important part of the health of people. This brings me back to a ketogenic diet. 
Why am I so adamant about teaching patients and families and communities about a ketogenic diet? Because of the different ways it helps the overall function of the body. Within two weeks of peeing a ketone, I hear patients reporting how much better they sleep, which matches that study we just talked about. Why would their sleep be better within two weeks? Well, I contend that part of the sleep problem is poor nutrition. Your brain is made up of 60 to 70% fat. And each one of those wires or circuits running through your brain is insulated with fat. When your body is fueled with carbohydrates running on sugar, your system has higher inflammation and the quality of fat that you make is less. We can see that in the biopsies of brain, animal brain studies that the quality of their fat is not nearly as insulating to the circuits throughout the brain. The second thing is chronic increased sugars, which are usually found in people who fuel their bodies from carbohydrates, are linked to increased inflammation. Inflammation is like water. So your brain has a slight swelling when your sugars are high. And we can see this from the studies that look at brains suffering from diabetes. Those brain cells go offline. Those brain cells don't function as well, in part because of this inflammation. Inflammation in the brain is not a healthy thing. It doesn't make for better cognition. A ketogenic diet does have a higher level of nutrition and the fats needed to grow healthy fat cells that insulate your brain circuits. But the second thing that I see happen with my ketogenic patients is that they are forced to deal with magnesium issues. Magnesium is one of those minerals that is low in everybody we study. It is across the globe low, in part because our soils have been become depleted in, in magnesium. And even if we eat high magnesium foods, many times those foods don't have the level of magnesium that we would have expected in them. Who cares? Most of the time, nobody cares. But there are a lot of symptoms that are linked to low magnesium. And most of the time, patients will point to other things besides magnesium to give the blame. When you go on a ketogenic diet, that first couple of weeks, you lose a lot of minerals, in part because you're flushing out this extra fluid that was held onto by those glucose molecules. Without the magnesium in your system, it drops and your symptoms become unable to ignore. They have muscle cramps, they get very moody, they feel lightheaded, and all of these are in part due to low magnesium. Replacing your magnesium is a good idea no matter if you're on a ketogenic diet or not. But my ketogenic diet patients can't ignore their low magnesium. It really forces the issue to say, this has been a problem and we must address it if you wanna feel better. Between the improved nutrition and the fact that we force the conversation about magnesium, I think these are two reasons why the ketogenic diet links to improved sleep in my patients. If you wanna learn more about the ketogenic diet, check out my other videos or check out the book that I wrote any way you can. Until next time, this is Dr. Bosworth, thanks.